and welcome and it's a great Sunday and we just thank God for again keeping us for another week being with us having his hand upon us um, he's a merciful God he's a loving God and he's a mighty God um, so this morning we continue our message um, last week called finding rest in Jesus that's what we continue this morning and our reading uh, was from Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. We're continuing that passage this morning. Um, we said last Sunday that the message was important. Why? Because we find ourselves in a society where people and society and the world is in a constant state of restlessness. A constant state of mental restlessness, emotional restlessness, psychological restlessness, and spiritual restlessness. We said that people are burdened, they are weary in society, in, in the world, uh, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, and that no matter where they seem to go to, no matter what they seem to do, they never seem to find rest and peace for their souls. Why? Because the only one who can grant us true peace and the only one who can grant us true rest in this world is Jesus. Ultimate peace and ultimate peace with God was secured for us by Jesus. In Matthew 11, we read last week, 28 to 30, Christ tells us how we can get this peace. He tells us how we can get this rest. Let's read it. He says to us, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what we are seeing here is he's telling us, first of all, to come to him, Secondly, to take his yoke upon us. And thirdly, to learn from him, to follow him, to be like him in character and nature. Last week we explained what a yoke was. And we said that a yoke was a wooden beam that was placed on the neck of the animal. And the farmer, using reins attached to the yoke, would guide that animal in the right direction so that the animal can plow the farm in straight lines so that the seed can be planted. We also said last week that without the farmer guiding the animal with the yoke, the animal will be all over the place, directionless and purposeless. Similarly, taking Christ's yoke upon us means what? Allowing Jesus and his word to be the only thing that directs our hearts and our lives and allowing Christ alone to lead us, to guide us, and be our Lord and Savior. Nothing else. And he promises. The Lord promises that if we come to him. If we come to him. If we take his yoke upon us. If we fall under his authority and his power and his kingship. That he will give us peace. And that we will find rest for our souls. It doesn't mean that our problems will disappear. It doesn't mean that we're going to have a problem-free life or a trial-free life. What it means is that even in the midst of that trouble, that we will have a divine peace that transcends all understanding. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, the Lord tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That if we come to him as we read now and take his yoke upon us, he will give us rest. Why? Why does he say that? He says that because we serve a God that is the father of all compassion and all comfort. The God that we serve is the father of all compassion and all comfort. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. What does it tell us? It says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The father of compassion means that he is the originator of compassion. That compassion begins with God. That compassion starts with God. 
that real compassion comes from God. And what? And the God of all comfort. He is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And what does he do? Who comforts us in all our troubles. He comforts us. He gives us peace in the midst of our troubles. He consoles us in the midst of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. God is the father of all compassion. He is the father of all comfort. He is the God of all comfort. It means compassion and comfort start from God. It means that the supernatural comfort and peace that can grant us peace in the midst of any trials comes from God alone. The supernatural comfort and compassion and peace that will get us through any difficulty, any trial comes from God alone. It means that God being the father of compassion and God of all comfort means that the greatest, the deepest, the most powerful comfort and compassion and peace that you and I can ever experience or have in the midst of any difficulty in life comes from God alone. Ultimate peace is peace with God. The ultimate peace that we can have is actually peace with God. And that peace with God is possible only through Jesus Christ. If you don't have peace with God through Christ, it doesn't matter what other peace you have, it doesn't compare and will not save you. The ultimate peace that we have is peace with God and Jesus secured that peace for us by dying upon the cross for us, by having our sins upon him, taking our judgment upon him so that we can be reconciled back to God. If you don't have peace with God, it doesn't matter what you do, where you go, how you do it. Life is pointless. The only peace, the ultimate peace that matters is peace with God. And it's secured and possible only through Jesus Christ. I want us to know this. There is no situation. There is no circumstance. There is no trial that you can possibly go through in this life. I want us to know this and listen to this very carefully. There is no situation, no circumstance, no trial that you can go through in this life that God's divine comfort and compassion cannot get you through. None. There is nothing that we go through in this life that God's compassion, His divine comfort and divine peace cannot get you through. Why? Because He is the God of all comfort. He's the father of all compassion. And because he's a loving father. <clears throat> and we said last week that God cares about the burdens that we carry. He cares about the burden that his children carry. And he promises to never leave us and to never forsake his children. That's his promise to his children. Now we can either believe it or we cannot believe it, that is not God's problem. That is our problem. He promises that he will never leave us, nor forsake us. No matter how hot the fire, how deep the waters, no matter how difficult the trial or the difficulty you're going through, God promises to be with you. And we can either believe it and accept it by faith or not. But that is not God's problem. That is our problem. What does the Bible tell us? Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Read this last week. It says, in fact, from verse 5, it says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. God is not a God that's far off. God is here with us. 
He is with his children. The Lord is near. So what? Do not be anxious about anything. Don't carry any burden. Don't carry any weariness. Don't carry any anxiety. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by what? By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that is beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in who? In Christ Jesus. The Lord is near. He's not far. But oftentimes you act as if he's far away, as if he's blind, he's deaf, he's powerless. The word says he is near. So don't be anxious about anything. But with prayer and petition and thanksgiving in every situation, bring your request before God and his peace that is beyond human understanding is going to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. John 14. We're going to carry on. John 14, 27. What does Christ say to us? He says, peace I leave with you. He's talking to his disciples now. But to understand the kind of peace we get from Jesus. He says, peace I live with you. My peace I give you. So he's giving his disciples a peace. He gives his children a peace. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. There is something unique about the peace that we get when we come to Christ. There's something different about the peace we get when we come to Jesus. It's not the kind of peace that the world gives. That's why the world is in the state that it is. Because the only one who can give true peace is Christ. 2 Thessalonians. The only one who can give true peace is Jesus. The only one who can give true peace is Christ. We'll carry on. So what do we see in these verses? We see that the divine peace that is more powerful than anything that we can experience or go through in life comes from Christ alone. It comes from Jesus alone. Why? Because he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is called in the scriptures the Prince of Peace. He is referred to in the scriptures as the Lord of all peace. And as we read already, God is the God of all compassion and the God of all comfort. And so is Jesus. And it was, the, it was his compassion for us that led him to that cross. And it's because of God's great compassion towards us that we are saved. But there is a condition. And we see these conditions in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. We must come to Jesus we must take his yoke upon us. That is to surrender to him, to submit to him, be guided by him, be led by him, walk in obedience to him, and we must learn from him. And we learn from someone to be like that person. We don't learn to disobey. We learn to be like that person. We learn to emulate that person. We learn to be like them in character and thinking. He says, come to me, take my yoke, and learn. To be strengthened by his word, transformed by his word, and to be shaped into his character. That is what it means to learn from Christ. So when we come to church, it's not a gathering. It's not a social club. It's not a waste of time. We come and we gather and we fellowship so that we are drawn closer to Jesus. So that we are shaped more and more into his character. That is why we fellowship. That is why we gather. So that we are drawn closer to the Lord. So that we prepare for eternity. That is why we gather. 
We gather them so that we can get ourselves closer to God, prepare for eternity. That is why we meet. And if we're not achieving that, that is a problem. So Christ tells us, come to me. Take my yoke upon, upon you. Surrender. Submit. Let me guide you. Let me lead you. Walk in obedience to me. And learn from me. And that is why people would never find peace and rest for their souls if they are seeking that peace and rest outside of Jesus. Period. And that's also why when people come to Christ, when they give their lives to Jesus, when they surrender to Jesus, when they submit to Him as Lord and Savior, you know what happens? There is often a sense of peace that fills their heart. Everything can be falling apart around them. But there's a peace in their hearts that fills their hearts and their minds. When they surrender to Christ, there's often a real sense of a weight being lifted off their shoulders. Because they know that the God that they serve is in control. They have the sense of peace in their hearts and their minds. Why? Because they came to the Lord of all peace. They came to the Prince of Peace. They took his yoke upon them and they trusted him. And that's what we see in Isaiah. That's what we see in Isaiah 26, 3. What does, what does the word tell us? Isaiah 26, 3 tells us that what? You, that is God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. That is, whose minds are focused on you. Why? Because they trust you. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. That is focused upon the Lord because they trust Him. You will keep in perfect peace. The peace that Jesus gives is not like the world. The world's peace is temporary. The world's peace is false. The world's peace will fade away. The world will give you peace but give you trouble in return at some point. But the peace that Christ gives us is eternal. Unshakable peace. Divine. But we see here in Isaiah that we have to keep our mind focused and steadfast upon the Lord to enjoy that peace. The same thing, John 14. John 14, 27. We read just now. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, I do, not, I do not give to you as the world gives. Christ's peace is different. And so don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid for nothing. We said last Sunday that a person is under either one of two yokes. Either the yoke of the authority of Jesus Christ, which is light and easy, or the yoke of sin and Satan, which is heavy, difficult, and destructive. And we said last week that there is no in-between. There is no in-between, and all of us must make a decision. All of us must make a choice. And the choice we make in this life, the decisions we make in this life, will determine what happens when we stand before the Lord in the next life. That's how it is. We are either under the yoke of Christ or under the yoke of sin and the enemy. There is no in-between. No in-between. What does the word say? It says that this thief, that is Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy. That's on one hand. The thief, that is Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy. So the yoke of Satan results in loss. It results in death. Results in destruction. What does Christ say? I have come that they may have life. I have come that they may have life. Everlasting life, eternal life, spiritual life. And have it to the full. 
There is opposites here, huge opposites. So Satan comes to do what? To steal and to kill and destroy. But Christ has come that we may have life. Life. And happen to the fool. He came that we may have life and have it to the full. 1 Peter 5.8, another verse. To show the contrast between the yoke of Jesus and the yoke of sin. The yoke of Jesus and the yoke of Satan. It says here, be alert and be of sober mind. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion doing what? Looking for someone to devour. Nothing good comes out of the yoke of Satan. Nothing good comes out of the yoke of sin. Nothing. But Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. So what we see in these verses are that sin and Satan are sin and Satan are terrible taskmasters. Terrible. They will always cause loss, death, and destruction. Guaranteed. And as long as a person is under the yoke of sin and Satan, it is going to fill their lives with emptiness, fill their lives with brokenness and bondage. And even if they appear to be having the time of their lives apart from God, even if they look happy on the outside apart from God, the fact is that deep down they are empty and they are dying spiritually. Because we see that true life, true fulfillment and peace comes from Jesus. What well, Satan's intention is to destroy, to steal and to kill. But that's good news. That is why Jesus came, isn't it? That is why Jesus came. That is why Christ came into the world. He came to destroy what? The power and the control of sin. He came to destroy the works of Satan and the life of those who surrender and those who believe in him, those who accept him, who walk in obedience to him, who trust him, who follow him, who have faith in him who surrendered to him as Lord and Savior. He came to destroy the works of Satan in their lives completely. He came to bring deliverance, freedom, and peace with God. And he came to set free anyone and everyone that's been held captive by the power and the yoke of sin and the enemy. That's what my Bible tells me. That's what my Bible says. Christ has come to destroy the power and the control of sin, the work of Satan, and to set free everyone, anyone who comes to him from the power of sin and the yoke of sin and of the enemy. If we read 1 John 3.8, let's read some, uh, some Bible verses. 1 John 3.8, who tell us says that the one, who sin, the, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So when we surrender to Jesus, he breaks the work of Satan in our lives. He breaks the yoke of Satan in our lives. It is his, it is his spirit that gives us the willingness to want to do the will of God and acts in a line, line with the will of God. So Jesus breaks the hold and the power of sin and Satan over our lives. In Hebrews 2.14 Let's go there. It says here that he, that is Jesus, he to share in the humanity so that what? By his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. That by the death of Christ and his resurrection, Christ broke the power of Satan, the power of death, and set free 
those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So fear results in slavery of the mind, emotion, spirit, of the soul. But Jesus, through his death, has broken that path completely. Colossians. In Colossians 1.13. What does it tell us? It says that for he, that is Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Listen to this. Christ has rescued us. He has redeemed us. He has taken us from the dominion of darkness, that is control of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we've been brought from darkness into Christ's kingdom. Through the mercy and the compassion of God. So we see that Christ came to destroy the power and the control of sin. Destroy the works of Satan. To bring deliverance and freedom and peace. And to set everyone and anyone free. But what we see tragically and sadly is that the reason why society and the world continues to be the way it is, increasingly weary and burdened and confused, is because many refuse to come to Jesus. They refuse. But Christ tells us that he will never turn away. He will never turn away anyone who comes to him. People refuse to come to Christ. They refuse to come to their salvation. They just will not come to the point where they surrender to Jesus. And then we wonder why society is the way it is. We wonder how and why our lives are the way it is. Because something else has gotten a grip over our hearts and our minds. And Christ is saying, come to me. Come to me. Those who are weary and burdened by brokenness and addiction and sin, come to me. Take my yoke. That is non-negotiable. And learn. But men will not come. Men will not take the yoke of Christ upon their lives and they will not learn. Do you know what John 3.13 tells us? John 3.13. Do you know what it says? It says that I've lost my passage now. Sorry. One John. Sorry. Lost my passage. I've lost my passage. But anyway, what the Bible tells us is that men loved darkness rather than light. That men loved darkness rather than light. That's what the word tells us. Men love darkness rather than light. So it is no wonder that the world is in the condition that it finds itself. It's no wonder that we're in a situation that we find ourselves. John 3.19 it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, that is Jesus. John 3, 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. People love the darkness instead of the light. So Jesus has come into the world, 
But they refuse to come. Why? Because they love the darkness instead of the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. The reality is that at some point, we will all come before Jesus. All of us. At some point, we are all going to come before Jesus. Either in this life or in the next. At some point we'll experience Jesus either as Savior through surrender, through submission, or as judge. That is a guarantee. That is not, that is not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. It's a guarantee. But men refuse to come. They would not submit. They would not surrender. They refuse. Because they love darkness rather than light. And so because humanity would rather choose darkness over light, then the current state of society that we find ourselves in is nothing more than society eating the fruits of its choices. Period. So when you take God out of schools, out of society, out of the family, and you let Satan in, it's no surprise that we find ourselves where we find ourselves. And whether it's society at large or at individual lives, the same principle appears. We have to come to Jesus. We have to take his yoke, surrender and submit, and we have to learn from him. That is the condition. God is not going to negotiate on those conditions. But thank God, thank God it doesn't end there. Amen? Even though men love darkness rather than light, thank God it doesn't end there. God is indeed the God of all compassion, the Father of all compassion, the God of all comfort, the Father of all comfort. Thank God that there is hope. Because as we saw in Colossians 1.13, we're reminded that what we are rescued, we are delivered, we are set free from every power, every dominion of darkness. Through who? Through Jesus. We must come to him. We have to come to him before we can be set free. We have to come to him before we can be saved. We have to come to him to have peace with God. We have to come to him to have eternal life. Remember last Sunday we said that Christ excludes no one. He excludes no one and no situation. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he said what? Come to me all, 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 all. And we said last week that it was. It means that no matter what is causing you to be weary and burdened and heavy in your spirit, bring it to Jesus and you will find rest for your soul. The enemy and our flesh sometimes wants us to believe that no matter what we are going through, that somehow, in some way, that our situation is greater than God. That somehow, in some way, he can't handle it. That somehow, in some way, he's going to leave us, forsake us. But remember that every manner of burden Every manner of weariness, every manner of bondage, every manner of addiction, every manner of brokenness, every manner of struggle, every manner of sin and problem is under the authority and the power of Jesus. We either believe it or we don't believe it. But that is not God's problem. That is our problem. That's what the Bible says, well, we have to stand firm in our faith or we will not stand at all. That is a choice we have to make, not God. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that supersedes the power and the authority of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. It is Jesus 
Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus alone that has the final say. Christ, God, has the final say over every situation and every circumstance in our lives. Jesus alone. No one else, nothing else has the final say over our lives except Christ alone. But again, we must come to him. We must surrender to him. We must follow him, put our faith in him, live for him. Friends, time is short. Time is very, 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 very short. We don't see it. We don't realize it. But time is short. And every passing day brings us closer and closer to Christ's return. And the sooner we draw close to him, the sooner we have peace with God, the sooner we are established and firm in our faith, the better it is for us. Christ tells us in John 14, what does he say to us? He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't allow your hearts to be troubled, to be anxious, to be burdened. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Believe in God, believe also in me. Therefore, if you believe in me, don't allow your heart to be troubled. Don't allow your heart to be burdened. Don't allow your heart to be weary. And why does he say that? Why would Christ say something like that? Why would he say that? Let's read Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18. Why would Jesus say that? Speaking to his disciples, he says to them, and verse 18 says, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Over every situation, every circumstance, every challenge, all authority, everything falls under Jesus. Everything. So no one has the final say over your life, over your situation, except God says so. John 3.35. Let's carry on. John chapter 3 verse 35. It says here, the Father, that is God, loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. God has placed everything in the hands of Jesus. Everything is in His hands. All authority belongs to Him. Everything is in His hands. And Philippians 2, 9-10, a very, very powerful verse that says, listen to this. No matter what you are going through, this is a very, very important verse to always refer to. No matter what you are experiencing, it's a very important verse that reminds us that Christ at the end is the one that is in control. No man, no woman, nothing has control or authority over your life except Christ. If you submit to him, if you surrender to him, if you believe in him, Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee will bow. They will surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. They will recognize the authority and the power of Jesus. What? In heaven. In earth, under the earth, and that every tongue is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. For their conditions. Must come to him, take his yoke, surrender to his authority, and learn from him. And God will never negotiate those standards. The wide road is wide for a reason. 
The wide road is wide because there are people who want to take on the yoke of the Lord and the yoke of Satan. Do you want to have the yoke of Jesus and live like the world? It will never happen. That's the wide road that leads to destruction. The narrow road that few find is a road that is there for those who take upon themselves only the yoke of Jesus. They are led by Jesus. So coming to Christ, we said last Sunday, implies that we have to leave something behind. Coming to Jesus means you have to leave something behind. So for those without Jesus who are weary and burdened and seeking rest with their souls, coming to Jesus means they have to leave behind their old and sinful way of life and come to Christ. Coming to Jesus means repentance. It means turning away from the ways and values of the sinful world and turning to God's ways. And surrendering to God's will and God's purpose. That is what it means to come to Jesus. You can't come to Jesus and stay where you are. It is impossible. Coming to Christ means repentance. And by the way, if you look at Matthew 4, 17, what did Jesus preach? He preached repentance. Turning away from the old way of life, leaving it behind. And allowing him to be the Lord and Savior of our souls. He did not preach prosperity. He didn't preach signs and wonders. Even those, yes, God is a God of signs and wonders. But the first thing he preached in Matthew 4, 17 was repentance. In fact, let's turn to it. Matthew 4, 17. It says here, from that time on, Jesus began to preach what? Repent. Not prosperity, not signs and wonders. From that time, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come here. Coming to Christ means letting go of everything else that we have placed our faith and trust in apart from God and putting our faith and trust totally in Christ. That's what it means to come to Christ. Yes, God can work through people. Yes, God can work through circumstances. But first and foremost, our faith and our hope must be grounded in Jesus, in who he is, and his promises. And I said just now that we cannot hold on to the world and hold on to Jesus. It is impossible. We cannot come to Christ and hold on to our brokenness. We cannot come to Christ and hold on to our weariness. We can't come to Christ and hold on to our disobedience and also sinfulness. We have to come to him as we are. And I've said this many times, but we cannot remain as we are. We're not doing God a favor. Oftentimes we act as if we are doing God a favor. We act as if, you know, we give him the bare minimum, like we're doing him a favor. One, of, one day all of us will pass away. All of us will pass away. One day all of us will come into an experience with the creator of the universe and will realize how mortal we are, how fleeting we are, how truly our lives are nothing but a breath. And we realize that we've made a very, very huge mistake by treating the Lord as if we're doing Him a favor. And for taking His grace for granted. His grace is not meant so that we can abuse it, but rather to cause us to repent and turn to Him. He wants us to come to him as we are, yes, but not to remain as we are. And anywhere where they tell you that you can have Jesus and live like the world, are lying to you. Anywhere where they tell you they can have Jesus and you can live any way you want, that is covered by the blood, it's a life in the pits of hell. 
Anywhere where they are only preaching prosperity and signs and wonders without sin and repentance and consecration and righteousness and holiness, it's a lie. We cannot afford to play games anymore. Time is short. The Lord is coming. He's coming back for a holy people, a holy church, a prepared people. There is no in-between. There is no in between. Second Corinthians six seventeen. What does the Lord say? Come out from them and be separate. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We cannot come to Jesus and hold on to the world. It's a deception. The word of God is clear. Come out from them and be separate. Be consecrated. Be holy. Touch no unclean thing. Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness. And I will receive you. But the reason why the church, and this is a separate sermon by the way, the reason why the church today is in a state of confusion is because we're trying to get under the yoke of Jesus and under the yoke of Satan. That's the reason why there's confusion. We're trying to hard carry the yoke of Jesus and the yoke of the world. It is impossible. And that's why we are told very clearly in Matthew 11 that we are to take the yoke of Jesus alone upon us and learn from him. And that means complete surrender to his lordship. Complete surrender to his authority over our lives. It means allowing only Jesus and his word to be the only thing that directs the course of our lives. The only thing that sits upon the throne of our hearts. And that means that we must be willing to lay aside the yoke of sin the yoke of Satan and the yoke of the world. There must be a separation. Not just externally, but internally in our hearts as well. There must be a separation, a consecration, a walk in holiness. There must be. We often think Christ will come and, you know, come and lovey dovey. No. He's coming for a holy people, a prepared people, and time is short. The Bible tells us and makes it clear that no one can serve two masters. As we close. No one can serve two masters. It is impossible. We cannot continue to live intentionally like the world and claim to be under the Lordship of Jesus. It is impossible. We can't serve two masters. And God's word makes it clear that there is no relationship. There is no relationship between light and darkness. None. No relationship. There must be a separation. Coming to Christ means we have to leave something behind. Taking his yoke upon us means that we have to let go of the yoke of sin and Satan and the world. Learning from him means that we have to stop being and learning what the world is doing and learning what Christ is doing through his word. There is no relationship between light and darkness. Second Corinthians 6.14 says to us, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. That is the world. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be yoked together with the world. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? 
But you have Christians today that carry the name of Jesus and want to live like the world. It is impossible. We want Jesus, but we want that thing that our flesh craves at the same time. It is impossible. Completely. We need Christ and Christ alone. His yoke alone must lead us, guide us. Obedience is not a suggestion. Holiness is not a suggestion. We're not going to stand before God one day and make excuses. He will not listen. He will not clear care. care. There must be a separation between us and the world. So it means that we cannot come to Jesus and live like the world. We cannot come to Jesus and act like the world. We cannot come to Jesus and, yes, dress like the world. Yes, it's true. There must be a separation, a distinction between the children of God and the children of the world. There must be. We must be set apart in our hearts and our minds and our lives unto the Lord. We must be holy as he is holy, not just outwardly, because you can be outwardly looking holy, but inside you might be filled with pride and unforgiveness and lust and all those other things. No. But we must be holy, not just outwardly, but more importantly, inwardly. Allowing the Spirit of God to do the work in our hearts, to transform us from the inside out, and the rest will take care of itself. In closing... What we have to understand is that time is short. Time is short. Time is short. No matter what your burden is, no matter what is causing you to be weary in your spirit and in your soul, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Lay it down on his feet. And he will give you peace. Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy. That is his objective. But Christ came to give us life. But God will not force any man, any woman, any child to come to him by force. No must come willingly humbly and he will give us peace let's pray